Um, so I've introduced myself already. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. It's um, a great honor and a privilege. Thank you, Ernest. Um, I am going to talk, my talk will be anything between 20 and 200 minutes, um, hopefully the former, but it may run over a little bit because we've got some really- No worries, no worries. You go ahead, we've got time. We've got some, we've got some really exciting things to, to discuss, um, including a live demo of the Gods Are Willing, um, which also involves Raspberry Pis. I've got a little setup here, which I'm gonna share with you in a, in a bit. Um, so there's some fun things happening. What what I want to, I've put this image on this slide because not only because it's topical, um, funny and probably not so funny all at the same time. Um, it is quite um, pertinent, I think, because um, we use Kubernetes as the de facto standard container platform, um, orchestration platform um, today, but it's hard, it's quite hard. Um, distributed applications are hard anyway. Microservices, um, you know, make the, we used to deal with monoliths and that was easy. And now we've got microservices and, and we've got all sorts of, um, issues and problems that we have to deal with. It's not for the faint hearted cloud native engineering is tough today. Um, so in this talk, I want to look at how, what, the way I see platform evolution going and how we can address some of the complex issues. Um, so this guy, several years ago, this guy, Sean Treadway at SoundCloud, listed 48 concerns of a single microservice. And I think this there's actually three times as many as that or more, right? Distributed computing is hard. Um, it's insane the number of things we have to think about. And so, I kind of wonder what we're doing wrong, especially seeing as we've got like this CNCF landscape, which is which represents an incredible um, amount of innovation and technology and amazing things. But it's got almost a thousand products in the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation landscape, um, backed by companies that have a market capitalization of $15 trillion and a funding of $16 billion. So this is an industry in its own right. And it's enormous. And this is all to help us run microservices and cloud native applications on top of Kubernetes mostly. Um, so I wonder why that's so hard. Um, you know, large organizations have to have separate platform teams. Kubernetes was actually designed as a platform for building platforms, really. And so, you know, its extensibility has been a major part of its success. Um, and all of this stuff does make for a really, really nice, um, solid environment to run microservices, but there's so much of it and navigating it is really difficult. So I started thinking about what's happening with platforms and um, I picked out a few things that are helping. They're helping by uh, allowing us to reduce the weight of our services um, by pushing stuff down into the platform below it. So as the platform becomes more capable, our services can become smaller and lighter. And we as um, application developers don't have to worry about so much. And this is the trend that seems to me that, that is happening. So we start with Kubernetes. Um, if we add it, something like Istio or a service mesh, Linkerd perhaps, on top of Kubernetes, then we um, we can abstract away some of the network related um, parts of us of our um, of our service. If we use something like Dapper, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, we can abstract away some of the application concerns as well, like talking to a service bus or a, um, a, a database or something. Um, Wasm Cloud is a really interesting thing because this is a new paradigm using WebAssembly on the server instead of in the browser. Um, and it's also written in Rust, which is great. Um, and so the, a large part of the talk um, 
is going to be around Wasm Cloud. And then I think there's even further we can go with this and something like Unison Cloud. So Unison is a programming language where functions are compiled, uh, functions are immutable and they're compiled once, tested once. Um, they are addressed by a content based addressing scheme, like a, a, a digest a hash of the contents, um, which makes for all sorts of interesting ways of, I mean, you could imagine um, a global substrate onto which you just deployed these immutable functions. And Unison is something that's really interesting and worth looking at, but I'm going to really stop at Wasm Cloud today because Unison Cloud's in the future, I think a little bit. Um, so when we're building microservices, this is what it feels like to me sometimes. <laughs> This is what our actual services feel like, let alone the platform and the um, environment that they run in. And so we have to think about how we can reduce the complexity of our services and shrink them effectively to just what's important. And there's a few pattern, architectural patterns for this. One is the hexagonal architecture, or often called ports and adapters, where we have a pure functional core um, with some interfaces. Um, or ports, and then adapters that plug into those interfaces or into those ports for input and output. Um, and we can plug different things in. So we could plug a database or a mock database or a user interface or a test agent um, into those adapters um, that talk to the same ports. And that, that means that in a, the center of our, the core of our application is doesn't have any knowledge of the environment it's running in or anything outside, you know, all the side effects are pushed to the edge um, and it becomes really easy to test that core. Um, and very similar to the hexagonal architecture, almost identical really, is the onion architecture. And the, But I think this is easier to think of a microservice um, as an onion, where the outer layers um, are where the side effects are and we push those side effects to the edge. And we have a core and in the core, we just have pure functional um, business logic and types. The domain, um, we think about IO, but we don't really have any um, intimate knowledge of that IO. Um, then we have a, a layer outside it where we do have implementation for our IO. And then we pull the, the all the stuff together in the API layer and allow um, input and output to the outside world through the API layer. And there's an important direction of coupling. So the outer layers only know about the inner layers. And so the inner layers have no knowledge of the outer layers. And that makes the, the center of our microservice um, eminently testable, easy, really easy to test. So let's, let's have a look at what this looks like in code. So here's a bit of Rust that described that I put together. I don't know if you saw that there was a whole set of tweets of this exact pattern being implemented in lots of different languages. I thought I'd do one in Rust. Um, and it's it's on GitHub if you want to um, play with it, but it's, it doesn't really do anything. All it does um, is demonstrate the principle. So in the core, we have a simple function that just adds two integers together. That represents our business logic. It's really easy to test. You can see exactly how you would write a unit test for that. and um, or a bunch of unit tests, and um, you don't have any you don't have any knowledge or concern for the outside world. Then the domain layer, which is the next one, and the, the next this one, um, the yellow one there. Um, this is where we think about I/O, but not its implementation. So this add function here is asynchronous because we know that we're going to have to go out to a database for a value. Um, so we accept a function that returns a future um, a promise for that value. And also the, 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 the Y value that we want to add to it. And it returns um, a, a result of I32, which is wrapped in a, in a future because it's an asynchronous function. Um, and here we just wait on getting X. And once we've got X, we add it, we call into the core to do the actual business logic and return that value. We 
um, exit early on the await if that fails, because that's why we've got a result type. In the third layer, this is where we actually do think about the IO. This is this knows only about the IO or the outside world. So here is our getx function, which we're later going to inject into the domain function. Um, and it, it's where it, it calls the database. And I'm just returning OK7 here just um, to demonstrate that we called the database and we got seven back. In the API layer, um, we inject our dependencies. So we uh, take the domain, which calls into the core, and we take the infra, we plug them together. Um, so we pass the infra function into the domain, which calls the core, and that gets the result. And then find so that's our API layer, effectively the, the outside ring. That's that's what does the real work. Um, and then finally, there we're just calling that um, on an executor, just so that we can actually get the value back. So that's that's the pattern. I mean, obviously, real world um, examples are much more complex than that. So Kubernetes then. So we've got this onion, each microservice is an onion, and we run those on Kubernetes and we connect them with a network, a software divine network within Kubernetes, virtual private networking within a cloud uh, VPC or whatever. Um, that, that's typically what microservice applications look like today. Um, they talk on a local network. Each of those microservices is responsible for interacting with the outside world in its own right. Um, if those microservices are polyglot, potentially they're implemented in different languages. They each contain libraries um, and glue code and stuff that's going to be actually responsible for calling a database or publishing a message on a service bus, on a message bus. So what can we do to make that better? Well, we can add something, a service mesh like Istio or Linkerd. And what does that look like? Well, we put a sidecar into the pod alongside the microservice. Microservice hasn't really changed very much, but it does give us an opportunity to abstract and uh, abstract and extract um, the network level cross-cutting concerns. Um, so for instance, if we want to make sure that we're talking with mutual TLS to each of our services, Istio can do that for us with the sidecar. So we would just talk HTTP between the one service and the sidecar, then it would get bumped up to mutual TLS with a client-side certificate, which is managed with by Istio. The message will go across to the next sidecar or to the destination service sidecar, where it would get downgraded to HTTP before it calls the service. So now we've abstracted away um, the certificate management, the libraries for certificate validation, SSL connections, all that sort of stuff um, is, is abstracted away. So that makes it a lot easier. So we could say that our services are getting lighter. Um, then we can add something like DAPA, which is distributed application runtime from Microsoft. This is in version 1.1, I think, at the moment. It recently went to 1.0. It's 1.1 now. So it's good for production use. What DAPA does is it abstracts. It does a very similar thing to Service Mesh, actually, in the sense that um, it has a sidecar pattern as well. Um, but in that sidecar, we have effectively our outer, the outer layers of our onion. This is this is where we would talk to a database, to a message bus, to um, a key value store, um, to another service, to Twitter or Twilio or whatever. Um, and we have um, a, a common set of um, interfaces for describing those things. And so that means that, that that our microservice now can just be the domain and the core. Um, and we don't have to worry about those outer two layers. And we don't have to, you know, if, each, if this is a polyglot situation, for instance, and each service is written in a different language, that doesn't matter. Um, the, the outer layers, the sidecar is just dapper. Um, so already we're shrinking our microservice and making, that, making it a lot easier. Um, people have said that Dapper is service mesh done right. Um, 
it's basically a higher level of abstraction. It's abstracting away application level concerns um, to make that um, much easier for us to just concentrate on on what the where the real value in our services is, which is right in the middle. Um, it also, for the first time, makes our services much more portable. Because if you wanted to, you could move one of these services from Azure to AWS or even to the edge or onto on, on prem without any code changes whatsoever. Because the outer layers are just configured in. Um, so that's cool. Um, you can also use Service Mesh and Dapper together. Um, have two sidecars in your pod. Um, there is some overlap. Um, so, for instance, with mutual TLS that we talked about earlier, um, is Istio going to do the mutual TLS or is Dapper going to do the mutual TLS? Both of them could. Either of them could. You wouldn't want both of them to do it, but you could use either. And I, and I, I would suggest that it doesn't matter that much which one you would use, but I'd probably go for Dapper doing it rather than Istio, just because it's a high level of abstraction. Um, one of the things that Dapper gives gives us as well is like tracing for free between services um, because it's plugged in at a much higher level, so it's much easier for it to do that. Okay, so we've shrunk our core to just the domain, our microservice to just the domain in the core. And this is a bit more, bit more like an actor than it is a, um, a microservice. And in fact, Dapper does have actually an actor framework within it as well for like, you know, real actors in the sense of the actor pattern. Um, but um, these are still microservices, really. I don't know why it says actor cluster. Should probably say microservice cluster. Okay, then Wasm Cloud. Okay, so now this is a paradigm shift because instead of um, Docker containers, we're now going to use Wasm, a Wasm runtime, server side runtime, a sandbox effectively. Um, and this has like several ad ad advantages um, because. Well, I mean, um, Solomon Hikes, who, who was the CEO, founder of Docker, in 2000, uh, so he said, in 2019, he said, if WASM and WASI, which is the WebAssembly Systems Interface, um, contract effectively for, for um, determining what can and can't happen from inside the WASM container. Um, if that existed in 2008, we, we wouldn't have needed to create Docker. That's how important it is. WebAssembly on the server is the future of computing. Um, so what Wasm Cloud does is all written in Rust, and it actually is a effectively a um, host for um, a WebAssembly runtime. And each of these domain and core like little actors can run inside a WebAssembly sandbox, and then they can talk to capability providers, which represent the outer layers of our onion, um, just like Dapper in that respect. Um, so there are First party HTTP server, HTTP client, key value store, messaging, pub sub, blob store, event streams, even GUID and random number generation. Because remember, the actor can't actually do that. It couldn't, it wouldn't be able to create a GUID or a random number because you, you need the system to do that. You need dev random or whatever to be able to generate a random number. Um, you don't have access to that from inside the WebAssembly thing. So you need a provider to do that. And everything's done through a contract and through an interface. But what it's what what that means is that our actors can be can, can be really really small, and then there's a message bus in the middle that just connects everything together. This is a standalone Wasm Cloud host, so it has an in-memory message bus, and the actors talk to the providers. Um, the actors are signed WebAssembly modules, um, and they're signed with um, declared capabilities, or so. When you compile the when you you compile to WebAssembly and then you sign the actor and you sign sign it to say yes I can I can talk to an HTTP server or yes I can talk to another HTTP endpoint using an HTTP client. Um, so that makes it really really secure and we know that the code can't do anything that it's not been given permissions to do from the from the get go. So these are signed actors with assigned capabilities that securely connected to signed capability providers 
via a link and the link is what carries the configuration data like what port does is the http server listening on for incoming requests wilson cloud is not the only thing in this space there's another um rust create uh, rust project called lunatic which um is more even more lightweight actors as uh, very similar to the erlang otp platform um so worth worth checking out for sure so what happens if we connect multiple wasm cloud hosts together with something like nats nats is a messaging pub sub platform um which is brilliant in my opinion it's written in go unfortunately not rust um but it's part of the cloud native uh, compute found computing foundation landscape um and it's really really good at um abstracting away the topology of the network underlying network and there are several different ways of working with nats but the leaf node concept in La in nats allows us to be able to connect multiple wasm cloud hosts together in what's called a lattice and the lattice effectively uses the nats backbone as um it's uh you know, to connect, to basically create a flat topology. So to the application developer, there's just a cluster, but those clusters, those nodes can be anywhere on the planet. And in actual fact, you can build quite big NATS networks um, that combine clusters into a super cluster for resilience and for redundancy. And you can have like leaf nodes um, remote clusters everywhere. So the the, tur the, the light blue turquoise um, boxes there could be WASM cloud nodes, for instance, and they would just form one big cluster. And these clusters are self-healing, they're self-joining. They are, um, you know, if there's a network partition or whatever, they'll, they'll join back up again when that's healed. Um, really, really, really resilient. Um, and there is actually a global communication system that's built on NATS already um, provided by the people that the company Synadia, who um, who uh, are the stewards for the NATS open source project. Um, and this is actually a global network and you can connect your leaf nodes to this network um, for free as a developer. Um, and so you could <coughs> have a WASM cloud host running on a Raspberry Pi connected to um, a global network and then another Wasm Cloud host on another Raspberry Pi on the other side of the planet be part of the same cluster and not have to worry about any of the network topology be between no firewall ports, no no nothing. It just just works. Right? Um, I should say that like Wasm Cloud has a control plane and a data plane um, and they use different subscriptions and potentially you should possibly use different um, NATS infrastructure for them. But um, if you wanted to be like belt and braces secure, but I think um, don't really need to, to do that. I wouldn't have thought. So demo time. <laughs> I don't know if this is gonna work, so we'll see. Um, first of all, let me describe the demo. So we've got um, my MacBook here, which, um, is running a NATS server, and that's that NATS server is has top that is I haven't configured it in anywhere. I just started NATS server. That's all it is, and it acts as the effectively the control plane and the data plane for the Wasm Cloud cluster. Um, and in the Wasm Cloud host that's running on the Mac, we've got um, two capability providers. Um, that we're going to configure. One's an HTTP server and one's a logging server to collect the logs from um, our actors. And then we've got two Raspberry Pis, one um, which just res runs Wasm Cloud and that's going to run our actor. And another one which is going to run a provider, a custom provider that, we've, that I've written, which talks to an OLED display um, that's connected to the I squared C interface on one of the Raspberry Pis. So let's see. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to make a curl request to this HTTP server. That's going to, um, if this logical call flow, effectively, that request is um, collected by the, the actor, and that makes a call to the provider across the interface that we talked about. Um, and then the provider knows how to talk to the OLED display. So oh, demo time. This could all go badly wrong. Um, what I'm going to have to do is reshare my screen um, because I want to um, Actually, let's do to window. No, let's do entire screen. But I'll have to get rid of this one as quickly as possible. I was going to get feedback. There we go. Um, uh, right. So I don't know if you can see. Um, if I turn this around, you can see my little setup here, right? So I don't know if you can see that. I've got two Raspberry Pis an OLED display, um, rust sticker. Um, and this this one, this Raspberry Pi here is going to be running the actor. This one is going to be running the capability provider, which knows how to talk to the OLED provider. So it's our business logics in here. Um, the outer rings of the onion are in here and they're connected to um, the switch. Um, and then Hopefully you can see my screen. So if I start the, you can do this in any order. It doesn't make any difference. But if I, I've got, um, I start the Wasm Cloud um, host on my MacBook. This um, is just saying where the NAT server is for the, for the cache, the cluster state, effectively. Um, so if I start that up. Um, we should be able to see it connects to the NATS um, server. This is the public key um, for the NATS, for the actual, no, sorry, for the Wasm Cloud host. Um, it loads a couple of um, capability providers, which um, this one has the good number generation and the random number, etc. you know, some extra stuff that you get in every, in every Wasm Cloud host is built in. Um, and that's it effectively. So we've got now got this host controller, Wasm Cloud host running. On the Raspberry Pi 01, um, <clears throat> we can run Wasm Cloud again. We're telling it where the control plane is. We're telling it where the data plane is. They're both the same NAT server that's running on the Mac. Um, ignore our live updates, it doesn't really matter. And we're labeling it with a name as Pi 01. So that's, that's how we know we can tell it to where to run the actor. So the, the cluster will hold an auction and work out where the suitable, best suitable places are to host the actor, but you can do it with constraints and stuff, and that's what I'm using the, that for. So we start that up, and we can see that that joins the same um, cluster. And now we've got two machines in our cluster, and then on Pi02, um, exactly the same thing. So now we've got three. So if I do like wash, wash is um, a WASM shell that um, is used to control all the clusters. So if I do a wash control get hosts, we should be able to see that there are three hosts in our cluster. One's been at 97 seconds, 114 and 127. These are the three public keys of the clusters. Um, and let's quickly look at, um, source code for this because in um, here we've got the shell script. So every actor is signed with a, with a private key and that's the public key for the actor. This is the public key for the um, extras that I'm using, the HTTP provider, the logging provider and the OLED provider that I've written. All the providers start with a key that have a key which starts with V, actors have one with M for module. Um, Hosts have, I think, N, was it? Yeah. So um, the keys are quite easily identifiable as to what they are. What we do then is we, we start um, the provider that knows how to talk to the OLED display on Pi01. Um, we start the HTTP server on the Mac. 
start the logging server on the Mac. Um, we start the actor on um, the second Pi. And that could run anywhere. I mean, I, I could run it on Pi one. Um, I could run it on the Mac. It doesn't really matter where the actor runs. It's all part of the same cluster. And then we link the actors and to the providers. And what the link does is it allows us to specify a contract and potentially some data associated with that. So when we want to talk to the HTTP server, we want that to listen on port um, 8081. Um, this is the contract for the OLED provider. So then when I run this script, what we should see is we should see um, the OLED provider starting on PIO1, the actor starting on PIO2, and the HTTP server and the logging, HTTP provider and the logging provider starting on the Mac. So I just run that. Um, and it should all spring into life. Okay, so here, here is the OLED provider starting and ready on PIO1. Um, here we've got the actor started. And on here we have um, the logging provider and the HTTP server provider starting 16 workers listening on port 8081. So if I hold this Pi up, hopefully you can see the display. Um, and if I call to localhost, which is the Mac, so that to the HTTP provider on port 8081, um, hello, Rust London Meetup. We get hello, Rust London Meetup on the display. I hope you can see this. Um, and then if I send it, um, curl x delete, it should take that off. Um, so the demo worked, which is good. Um, the code um, so very quickly. The actor, this is the actor. Um, so we initialize the handlers, one for the logging um, and one for the um, handler for the HTTP contract. And then this is the actual handle handler. Um, I've got just a static here, which requests um, a GUID because I don't know if you saw here, it should, when, when it's logging a request, the delete here, for instance, it should also be, oh yeah, here we go. Um, so that's the actor's public key. And then there's a GUID. So if I started an actor on another host, we'd get round robin load balancing between the multiple actors or not necessarily round robin probably, it's actually the closest closest one, you know, the smallest round trip. Round trip. Um, and so this GUID shows me, well, helps me understand which actor is responding. Um, but then if we get a post request, then we call the, um, the OLED interface. That's the provider that knows how to talk to the OLED. And we just call the update method on that with the text and check this response. And if we get a delete, then we call the clear method. And that's that's it, that is, that is the actor. That all, that's all it's doing. Um, it's just taking an HTTP request and calling the relevant um, function on the outer layers of the onion. Um, and then the provider does the interface, which is um, which is the contract effectively. And then I've got two files in here: the display, which is actually how to talk to the uh, um, you know the text box handling and everything like that for the OLED dis display. And then this is the actual um, capability provider. It's a little bit longer, but we declare the provider. We implement the clear and an update method on it. And then here is where we actually handle the calls. Um, we dispatch, um, depending on what kind of message we get, we dispatch to do a specific thing. Um, the providers, um, you only write once. The actors is where all the work happens. Um, and so we get that separation of our outer layers. Whoops, I need to stop sharing. Okay. And now I need to share my other tab again. Um, so, demo worked. 
fantastic. Um, so all the, um, in summary then, basically what, we've, what we're trying to do is we try to reduce the service weight by pushing um, capabilities down into the platform and abstracting away the work of talking to things that we talk to all the time and we don't want to have to re reproduce that or redo that every single time we write a microservice. So all the microservices um, are shrunk to just the business logic and they can talk to um, these things that are only written once and we don't have to redo that work every single time. Um, I've got a couple of blog posts here um, which I've written around this um, and there's also um, a link to the GitHub repository with the source code in it if you want to have a look um, I'll post it in the chat um, but I like this little thing to finish up with is that uh, if you if you talk about things and change the way evolve the way we talk about things then it helps people understand um, and spread these thoughts a bit more widely so please go ahead and spread spread them as much as you like um, because I think this is really the future of um, platforms. There's definitely WebAssembly on the server. It's zero trust. Being able to run small pieces of code that don't have permission to do anything other than what you give them permission to do. One of the things I forgot to show you actually was um, the, you can with Wash you can do a, like a claims inspect on the actor and you can see exactly what it's been signed with, what capabilities it's been signed with, and we could see, we would be able to see that it can talk to the HTTP server, the, log, the logging server, the extras, and the OLED provider, and nothing else. So if it tried to access file system, it wouldn't be allowed. If it tried to do anything else, it just can't do it. It's physically impossible. Um, OK, thank you very much. Um, obviously, I've got to do that. Um, but uh, that's it. Done. Thank you very much. Thank you.